several of us teach, and there are several other first-year seminar instructors in here. We develop our courses based on a theme, and I chose the theme of investigation. Uh, it, it is what it is, the first-year seminar is for freshmen. So as I began to develop the course, uh, I kept thinking, how am I going to, to gain the attention of a bunch of 18 and 19 year olds to teach critical thinking? You know, how do you teach critical thinking? Now that's kind of a tough nut to crack, but I am in the company of some very good people who helped me and guided me into the development of the course. And so I chose investigation because I'm a social worker, an academic, and I like research. And I was also a federal investigator for the Federal Public Defender in Pittsburgh for several years. And I worked in the capital habeas unit, mitigating the sentences of death row inmates. I have always been interested in the Rosenberg case since I was a young child listening to my parents talk about it. I was always um, actually quite upset about it for most of my life, always wondering what had happened to the Rosenberg children uh, and what was going on in their lives. So I thought, it's a good way to teach critical thinking. Let's, let's talk about the Rosenberg espionage case. We, uh, we first had assignments on serial killers. I had them actually conducting psychosocial assessments of serial killers because I wanted them, the students to understand how uh, the biological, psychological, and social environment affects our behavior, correct? Yes. And uh, they liked that assignment. When it came to the espionage case, they were a little iffy, you know, like, oh, let's stay with this, it's so sensational. But we forged ahead, and they've been absolutely brilliant. They conducted research, uh, their investigations were stellar, and I think they uh, found that out this morning when Mr. Mirapol spoke to them. Uh, they realized that many of their arguments were quite sound, and it showed that we have some tremendous critical thinkers as students at this university, and I'm very, very, very proud of them. So that's been absolutely great. With that, um, I decided that I would ask Mr. Mirapol if he would come and speak to the class, and lo and behold, he took me up on the invitation. And I'm, I'm so pleased about that. We decided that uh, in addition to the morning class, we would have this seminar in the evening and invite the public. And here you are. And I am just well pleased. Uh, Mr. Mirapol is a, a lawyer. He is the founder and former uh, CEO of the Rosenberg Fund for Children. And he'll talk about that in a bit. And I've had a delightful time. We had a wonderful dinner last evening uh, with colleagues and friends. It was tremendous. And uh, so here we are at the end of his stay. I'm going to miss you. <laughs> <laughs> we spent a lot of time together in the past couple of days. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Mr. Robert Mirapol. First, I want to thank everybody uh, who was responsible for inviting me and bringing me here today, uh, including Dean Pruitt and Professor Harmon, uh, and all of you for coming out this evening. Um, and I also want to thank whoever was responsible for today's weather. Uh, <laughs> Given that I'm flying home to New England tomorrow, I just ask one favor that you can keep it up for another day. Uh, so what I'm going to do tonight uh, is it's going to be a very different talk from what I gave this morning to the class, uh, which was mostly about my parents' case. But uh, there's a, there will be time for question and answers. And I am quite willing to address that in the question and answer period. But what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to focus on my childhood. 
how I survived it, where it led me, and the lessons I learned along the way. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more generally about the death penalty. Um, so, starting out, in 1950, when I was three years old, my parents, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, and by the way, for those of you who haven't put it together, uh, I was adopted by Abel and Ann Mirapol uh, after my birth parents' execution, and my name was changed, so that's why my name is not Rosenberg. Uh, and that, if people have questions about that later, I'd be happy to talk about that as well. So when I was three, my birth parents were arrested and charged with being master atomic spies for the Soviet Union, in particular for stealing what was called the secret of the atomic bomb. The judge, in sentencing them to death, said they altered the course of history against our country. Uh, and then when I was six, they were executed. And I grew up believing that my parents were framed and that a terrible wrong was done to me and my family by our government. Yet I consider myself lucky. That's because in 1990, I found my calling when I founded the Rosenberg Fund for Children and was able to make it my full-time job for the next 23 years until September of 2013 when I retired and my daughter, Jennifer, became the RFC's second executive director. Now my job until I retired in 2013 was running this foundation. And the Rosenberg Fund for Children, which I usually refer to as the RFC, is a public foundation that is providing for the educational and emotional needs of children in this country whose parents have been targeted in the course of their progressive activity. And I'm going to focus on the personal story of what happened to my brother and me after our parents' arrest in 1950. And I'm going to tell this story because I believe it's not just about me. But I think there's some general lessons to be learned from what I went through about helping children in general. Now, it was just two months after my third birthday in May of 1950 that my father was arrested. It was July of 1950, and I was asleep. My parents were cleaning up after dinner. My brother was listening to his favorite radio program. We didn't have a TV yet. The Lone Ranger on radio. When there was a knock on the door, and it was an FBI agent. Well, actually two FBI agents. And they arrested my father. Uh, and ultimately, my parents were charged with conspiracy to commit espionage, in particular, stealing the secret of the atomic bomb. Now, I believe to this day that my parents did not have anything to do with stealing the secret of the atomic bomb. But that's another talk. Uh, but two things I will say about that now. From the moment of my parents' arrest, they were given a choice by their captors. They were told, cooperate, that is, talk and name others who you were involved with. And if you do that, your lives will be spared. And because they refused, they were killed. And there's really no dispute about that characterization of what happened. And the fact that my parents had children was used to force their cooperation. Now, my mother's younger brother, David Greenglass, and his wife, Ruth, also had two children. And the government gave them the exact same choice. And they took the deal. And so they became the chief prosecution witnesses. And David Greenglass was sentenced to 15 years in prison and served 10 of them. And Ruth Greenglass got to stay home and raise the two children. Now, you may be aware of David Greenglass because he recently died just in the last few weeks. Well, actually died in July. but. 
the New York Times reported his death just a few weeks ago, and there was a fair amount of publicity about that. So it was in the news. Uh, now, I talked about my father's arrest. We lived with my mother for just a few more weeks in our small apartment on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Uh, now, I know it was a very small apartment because I remember the apartment very vaguely, but I remember it as being small. And anything that appears small to a three-year-old is probably pretty small. Um, and so we lived with my mother for a few more weeks, and then she went to testify before the grand jury that was investigating the case. And when she was done with her testimony that day, she was arrested. So she had left us with a babysitter, a neighbor. But then she didn't come home. The neighbor didn't know what to do with us. So she took us a few blocks away, also on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, to my mother's mother's house, Tessie Greenglass. Uh, and so we moved in with Tessie Greenglass. Now, that seems like a very reasonable thing to do. The parents get, don't come home, so you bring the kids to grandma. But it didn't work out very well. Uh, it turns out, and we learned this, one of the unique things about my parents' case is the fact that through a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit that we mounted in the 1970s, we ultimately forced the release of 300,000 previously secret files. And through the work of other researchers and other events that have happened, we know more about the government's internal investigations and the material that they developed related to my parents' case than just about any other major case of this sort that you can imagine. Uh, and so we got all these FBI files and all these uh, Department of Justice files. And the files indicate that my mother's mother, Tessie Greenglass, was cooperating with the government. She visited my mother in prison and she told my mother that she should back David Greenglass's story. In other words, my grandmother was telling my mother that she should leave her husband, point the finger at him, and back her son's story. Well, my mother refused. And so my grandmother, to put pressure on my mother, said, you know, the kids are driving me crazy. I can't handle them. Uh, and so if you don't back David's story, and she said, you know, if you back David's story, they'll release you. You can take care of the kids. But if you don't back David's story and they don't release you, then I'm going to take the kids and put them in a shelter. And when my mother still refused to do this, she dumped us in a shelter. Now, there were uncles and aunts on both sides of the family, uh, but they were, this was the McCarthy period. Everybody was terrified to be associated with communist spies. It was the worst possible thing. And, and for the younger people in this audience, I, I, I don't know if, I think the best way I can explain it to you, though it's not quite equivalent, is if you could imagine that instead of Osama bin Laden being killed, he'd been captured and brought to the United States and put on trial. And he had young children who lived in the United States. Uh, that was the way people, a lot of people in the United States, felt about my parents. They had given our arch enemy, the Soviet Union, the secret of the atomic bomb, the bomb that could destroy us all. There could be no worse people on Earth. So try to imagine what it was like being their children and try to imagine what it was like being their relatives. So everybody was scared. I had an aunt uh, who my father's older sister, she was very close to my father and really wanted to take us into her home. But her husband, who ran a small grocery store in Queens, New York, said that if 
if people find out that I've taken the Rosenberg children into my house, they won't come to my store. And so he refused to let her bring us into her home. And the same thing happened with all the other aunts and uncles. So we were dumped in a shelter. Now, my grandmother, and it's one of my first clear memories, uh, my grandmother didn't say to my brother and to me, uh, I'm putting you in a shelter because uh, I want to try to pressure your mother into backing David's story. No, what she said was that we lived, this was a cold water flat on the Lower East Side. There was no warm water. Uh, and so the toilet water froze in the winter time. And she said that it would be an unsanitary place to bring up small children. And it's one of my first memories of going into the bathroom and peering down into the toilet because I was fascinated by the concept of ice in the toilet. Uh, it was November, there was no ice, but what did I know? So off we went to a shelter. We spent six months there. Finally, my other grandmother, who'd been hospitalized earlier, uh, got out of the hospital, had an apartment, and she took us into her home, Sophie Rosenberg. We lived with her for a while, but that didn't work out so well either. I was lucky. My parents' trial took place in March of 1951. I was almost four years old. I wasn't in school yet, but my brother was eight. He was in the third grade in the New York City public school system, and he got a lot of harassment. It wasn't from the kids. What did eight-year-old kids know about this kind of stuff? It was from their parents when they found out who he was. He'd get thrown out of people's houses, and the spotlight, the publicity in New York City was so great that it was decided that we should be removed from New York City and brought to acquaintances of my parents who lived in rural New Jersey. So we moved out to Tom's River, New Jersey, uh, and we lived, this is what I think of as, as the, we sort of lived in semi-secrecy. Our name wasn't changed. There was no elaborate efforts to hide who we were, but the press stayed away and nobody seemed to know who we were there. Uh, so I started kindergarten in the fall of 1952 at Tom's River Elementary School. And then in the spring of 1953, especially towards the end, June of 1953, when the executions took place, uh, the press found us, reporters were swarming on the lawn, the school found out who we were, our anonymity was totally gone. We stayed in Tom's River that summer, and then I started first grade, Tom's River Elementary School. But over the summer, it turned out that the residents of Tom's River, New Jersey, became concerned that their children were going to school with the children of the Rosenbergs. So they petitioned the school board, and the school board asked the State Board of Education for a ruling, and the State Board of Education issued a ruling that stated that only residents of the district in the state of New Jersey could attend public school in New Jersey. And we were residents of the state of New York. We weren't residents of New Jersey. And so I have the honor, the dubious distinction, of having been thrown out of the New Jersey public school system at the age of six. Uh, so back to my grandmother's house. We lived there for a relatively short time until we were introduced to a childless couple named Abel and Ann Mirapol, Christmas time, 1953. We started living with Abel and Ann in January of 1954. Now, uh, there were relatives, as I said, but nobody would adopt us, and so my parents gave our legal guardianship to uh, their lawyer, Manny Block. Now, Emanuel Block found Abel and Ann Mirapol. It was really, it wasn't the way it would happen these days. He knew who Abel Mirapol was. Abel Mirapol was a writer. His most famous song, Strange Fruit, uh, which Billie Holiday made famous, uh, was a song about lynching, uh, and it's still 
very popular, famous song today. Uh, and so he knew about Abel and Ann, and Ann was a school teacher, Abel was a writer who worked at home, and he thought they would make good adoptive parents. He met them once, liked them, and said, okay, you can adopt them. Uh, so we moved in with the Mirapols. We started living with them. A few weeks after we started living with the Mirapols, Manny Block had a massive heart attack and died. And he had not completed the adoption papers yet. At that point, groups of people in the New York City area, mostly right-wing people, uh, filed petitions in the children's court. They said their uh, argument was essentially that, first of all, Abel and Ann Mirapol had custody of us, but they were not our legal guardians, which is true. Uh, but uh, they also said that Abel and Ann Mirapol were abusing us. Now, this wasn't physical abuse. It was political abuse. They were saying that we were being carted around to demonstrations and being forced to listen to grisly descriptions of executions, and we were being taught to hate our country. Basically, they were saying that because the Mirapols were supporters of the Rosenbergs, they couldn't be good parents. Well, so we were then seized by New York City police and taken to an orphanage. Well, at that point, some of the people who'd worked to save my parents' lives, some lawyers that got together, there was a custody battle. And I won't go into the details of that struggle at this point, but to make a long story short, we won that custody battle. We were reunited with Abel and Ann Mirapol. Our names were changed. We dropped from public sight. And that period that my brother to this day calls the long nightmare came to an end. Now, that was our first family victory. The people who wanted to take us from Abel and Ann Mirapol were not satisfied with killing my parents. They wanted to make sure that their legacy was destroyed as well. They wanted to make sure that me and my brother would grow up either burying what happened or reviling my parents. Uh, but they failed. In fact, you know, you could argue that the people who tried to take us away from Abel and Ann Mirapol wanted to make sure that I would never grow up to start something like the Rosenberg Fund for Children. Uh, but they didn't succeed. So instead, I grew up with a positive image of my parents and, in particular, of people who would put themselves on the line to help children. Because when I look at my parents' case, my personal heroes are the people who protected me and my brother. And they did so at great personal risk. I'll give you an example. There was a man who used to uh, drive us to school in the morning because during the custody battle there was a period when it was they were trying to figure out whether we would ultimately end up with Abel and Ann Mirapol, but we were instead sent back to my grandmother's house, Sophie Rosenberg. Now, my grandmother lived about two miles away from the school we were going to, so someone would come in his car and pick us up in the morning and drive us to school. Well, one of the things that would happen with people like that is that anybody who would come to our aid, there would be FBI agents who would take down their car license number, and then they would try to find out where their employers were. They'd go to their employer and say, do you know that one of your employees is helping the children of these communist spies? Um, and you know, people could lose their jobs. And this kind of things happened. So people who would put themselves out uh, to help in that situation became my personal heroes. Uh, and after my name was changed and we dropped from public sight, my life changed. Uh, Manny Block, my parents' attorney, after my parents' execution, traveled around the country uh, raising money on our behalf. Uh, the Mirapols didn't have much money. Abel Mirapol's most famous song, Strange Fruit, 
during the 1950s, uh, it was not played on the radio. It wasn't making any money. In fact, one of the people who used to sing Strange Fruit, the singer Josh White Jr., uh, he was hauled before what was called the House on American Activities Committee and asked if he was, uh, why he was singing this communist-inspired song. Um, and uh, he said to them, if you don't want me to sing it, I won't sing it. Uh, and so the Mirapols didn't have any money, but this trust fund enabled me to go to special camps and special schools. Uh, no one talked about it, but I kind of grew up as a child of the movement. Uh, uh, and, you know, and it's, it's hard to imagine, uh, but growing up in a large secular Jewish community uh, within the city of New York with sort of left-wing politics, there were a lot of people like that. There was a pretty big community. You couldn't find that kind of community in many places in the United States, particularly in the McCarthy period, but the New York City area was one of the few places where you could find it. And the result was that I grew up surrounded by a community of support. And I think, and this is, you know, really important, I think, for anybody going into social work, the community of support is, is really key. It enabled me to grow up with a positive attitude towards life and towards working for social change. So it only seemed natural when I grew up, when the time seemed right, starting in 1975, after people had learned through the war in Vietnam and through the Watergate scandal that the government might actually lie about things, that my brother and I would start a Freedom of Information Act suit, sue the government, and launch our effort to reopen our parents' case and go public with who we were. And in the process of doing that, you know, it was mentioned that I'm a lawyer, but I went to law school after this. I hadn't gone to law school yet. Uh, and my brother and I were, had, were, were engaged in a number of lawsuits and some, we were always, we were the plaintiffs. And there were some pretty big numbers attached to some of these lawsuits. And we, you know, we started spending the money, at least in our heads. Now, we never won any of that money, but we said, what are we, if we win this money, what are we going to do, you know? It wouldn't be right to just keep it for ourselves. So we got the idea that we'd start a foundation in my parents' name uh, with the money we won. Uh, it would be, and, and, well, we didn't know what the foundation would do, though it took me until 1989 to figure that one out. But when I finally figured it out, I realized that the Rosenberg Fund for Children was my way of, of repaying the community that nurtured me and my brother by building an institution that would nurture those children today who suffer what we endured in the 1950s. Now, and it may surprise you that there are children like that in the United States, uh, but there are actually hundreds of them, and on the back table, uh, there are some, you know, my book is for sale and it's very cheap, because uh, 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 we're interested in getting out the story and all the money goes to the foundation, but there's also freebies. These are brochures from the foundation that give you uh, a little idea about what we do, and those who want to look a little more deeply, there are copies of the newsletter uh, that talk about our beneficiaries. Um, but there are hundreds of children who are potential beneficiaries of the Rosenberg Fund for Children in this country today. For me, and I've been doing this for almost 25 years, all the pieces came together. I realized in working on the foundation and having it be successful that it wasn't only a good idea, it was a viable project. And I learned some lessons along the way. The first lesson is that Resistance is inspirational. When people resist, other people join them. And I, I suppose the best worldwide example of this, at least to my mind, is Nelson Mandela, who's sitting in prison for decades, and his resistance, his refusal 
to accept what the South African government was asking him to accept inspired a movement. Um, and that's what happened in my parents' case. My parents' refusal to say what the government wanted them to say inspired a community of support. And as I said, the community is key because it helps sustain the resistance and it maintains the inspiration. So my parents' executions were carried out, but their inspiration survived them. They wrote in their last letter to us that they died secure in the knowledge that others would carry on after them. And that's what I've tried to do with my life, and I think it's something we all can do. I think that trust that they exhibited in their correspondence was justified. Now, others also carried on after my parents by helping my brother and me. I always had my brother and supportive adults around me. And thousands of people have given to the Rosenberg Fund. Uh, and thousands of people gave to the fund that helped me when the, go to these schools and summer camps that enabled me to survive. So I never felt alone and I never felt isolated and I think that was the key to my survival. And I talk about all of this in my book and more, which was written in 2003. In some ways, I was in the process of writing it, which was mostly uh, 2001. Uh, I was just finished writing the book when September 11th happened. So I ended up writing a little epilogue. So even though the book is 11 years old now, uh, it is, it's more contemporary than it would have been if I had finished it six months earlier. Now, the second lesson I want to talk about is what I call constructive revenge. That is actually what I wanted to title my book. I wanted to call my book Constructive Revenge. Now, I'm not, I don't want to criticize the current title, which is An Execution in the Family, because that title was my wife's idea, and I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but I really like the idea of constructive revenge, but the publisher said, constructive revenge, what does that mean? That doesn't even make sense. Uh, well, I think it does, and I think that concept doesn't just apply to me. Uh, the, as I look at my own life, my challenge, I had two great challenges in my life. One was personal, and the other was sort of political, social, if you will. The personal challenge was to recreate the family that was torn apart. I think it is no accident that both me and my brother got married. We got married early. I actually got married so young I had to have my parents notarize permission. Um, uh, that we then right away had kids and that we've stayed married to the same people going on 50 years. Uh, that was to recreate what had been destroyed. But I also had a bigger political challenge. That was to engage the world, to figure out a way to do something meaningful, to turn the destruction that was visited into my, upon my family into something constructive for the benefit of other families. That's what I think of as constructive revenge. You know, when you think about it, there's no one in this room who hasn't had bad things happen to them. And when bad things happen to people, the first impulse is to strike out against those people who do those bad things to us. And I think that's a healthy impulse. That impulse for revenge is healthy. The problem with the impulse is that it's destructive. The trick is to take that energy, to take that destructive impulse, and to transform it into something constructive for the benefit of others. Uh, in other words, it's figuring out a way to have a positive response to something negative. You know, I talked about this a little in class this morning. We're all taught when we're small children that two wrongs don't make a right. Well, that only a plus can really cancel out a minus. 
And yet in this world, what children see is that adults apparently believe that two wrongs make a right. We see it all the time. I mean, that's really what the death penalty is all about. It's responding to a negative with another negative. And if we look at this politically in the bigger sense, take a look at September 11th. Our country faced the challenge of figuring out a positive way to respond to a negative. And I feared that we failed. And look at today. Now we have this group ISIS in the Middle East. Uh, it's a terrible, awful group doing horrible things. Um, you know, and we've seen the videos of Americans being beheaded. And what's the response? The response is the majority of the public seems to think the best way to deal with them is to bomb them into oblivion. Uh, I think of that response as the kind of bomb now, think later response. Uh, after all, look at all the good that bombing Iraq and Afghanistan has done. Uh, in fact, I would say all that bombing of Iraq and Afghanistan, and this is an interesting concept to present on Veterans Day, led to ISIS to begin with. Uh, now, you know, we're taught, our, our national anthem ends with the phrases that we're the land of the free and the home of the brave. But I fear we've become the home of the afraid. And if we are the home of the afraid, that makes us no longer free. So our government locks up millions of people. 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's prison population. Our government looks the other way at torture. And we end up as a public accepting universal spying by the National Security Agency upon us all. That doesn't sound like bravery or freedom to me. So I say let's not let fear and rage and revenge make things worse. Let's try to build a more just and equitable world. And I admit that's not easy. And you know, if, if someone were to say to me, well, how are you going to do that? I don't really have an answer. But I think that's the perspective that we need to bring to the situation in order to make things better. And that's how we go about having our constructive revenge. Uh, make, it, make the ground that is all too fertile for terrorism be infertile so terrorism can't grow. That's the way we'll become more safe. And that leads me to talk also about capital punishment in general. Because I think capital punishment in general is something that is in the same sort of in line with an attitude that seeks revenge rather than constructive revenge. Now, there are many reasons to oppose capital punishment. Uh, the one that has been most successful in the United States today, and the reason more and more states are abolishing capital punishment and fewer people are being executed, is what I would call strategic. And it's really a very simple kind of logical uh, way of looking at it. And that is, the problem with capital punishment is you can't make a mistake. Right? You can't execute someone and then realize, oops, and take it back. It's impossible. So it requires perfection because we can't afford to make a single mistake and execute an innocent person. But human beings are incapable of perfection. There's no one and no system that human beings have ever invented that is perfect. We always make mistakes. So if capital punishment requires perfection, and human beings are incapable of perfection, it means that capital punishment can't work all the time. Okay? And that people, juries have become to question that. It's one of the reasons that we have fewer people executed. Now, there are also political reasons to be against capital punishment, and that's pretty simple. Once you give the government the power of life and death, the government's going to end up abusing that power. 
And what I find kind of interesting is that there's somewhat of a positive correlation between people who distrust government, who say, you know, government is bad, we have to shrink government, we can't have government regulating things, we have to get rid of government in all cases, and yet those same people are often pro-capital punishment.